All right, we've got a big conversation ahead of us. So I'll just go ahead and do my little introduction here. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. My name is Liberty and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. Uh, tonight, we're excited to host a conversation um, sort of started with two abolitionist texts, uh, Rattling the Cages from AK Press. And of course, this event is uh, part of a series. If you haven't watched the others, um, they've been fantastic. So definitely go back and watch them on our YouTube channel. And a new title from PM Press, The Warehouse. Um, we had planned this conversation to include Eric King, um, James Kilgore, and uh, Vic Liu. But unfortunately, uh, Vic had to cancel at last minute and won't be able to make it tonight. But I'm still really uh, pleased and appreciative to have Eric and James with us. So Firestorm is a 16-year-old radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective um, in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. And we strive to feature books and events that reflect our values and our interests and the needs of um, marginalized communities in the South. We're also continuing to do uh, a fair number of events online um, because it expands accessibility and also allows us to connect with authors and speakers who might not make it to our community. Um, so tonight is a good example of that. Uh, and we do have several exciting events coming up over the next month that I would just want to call your attention to. Um, we've got uh, another event in this series with contrib uh, contributors to Rattling the Cages. Um, we've got a conversation on displacement in Appalachia. And we have uh, an author panel on um, trans feminine cyberpunk. So lots of cool stuff coming up if you're interested in keeping in the loop on that. Definitely follow us on social media and I'll share a newsletter link in our chat. So uh, tonight we are using Zoom um, and I wanna call attention to the Q&A tool, uh, which is gonna be a little button at the top or the bottom of your screen uh, that's sort of like two overlapping speech bubbles. Um, and we would love it if over the course of the conversation, you would jot out any questions you had for Eric and James and uh, we will do our best to get to uh, some of those questions uh, towards the end of our evening. Um, we also are going to have an open chat tonight, so um, feel free to uh, use that, although um, James and Eric may not be watching that chat, so if you need their attention or you want to ask a question, please do put it in the Q&A. All right, uh, we're going to get started with just a, a couple quick bios here. Um, for our guests, uh, Eric King is a father, author, and activist. Last December, he was released from the Supermax ADX prison after spending nearly 10 years as a political prisoner for an active protest over the police murder of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. He was held in solitary confinement for years and was met with violence by guards throughout his incarceration. Eric has published three zines, Battle Tested, Antifa in Prison, and Pacing in My Cell. His sentencing statement is included in the book, Defiance, Anarchist Statements Before Judge and Jury. Uh, and Eric now works as a paralegal for the Bread and Roses Legal Center. Welcome and thanks so much, Eric. We've also got James Kilgore, um, who is a researcher and activist based in Urbana, Illinois. Uh, Jim is one of two sons and life partner of African historian, Terry Barnes. He's the author of six books, including The Warehouse, uh, a visual primer on mass incarceration and understanding mass incarceration, a people's guide uh, to the key civil rights struggle of our time. He drafted four of those volumes during his six years, six and a half years um, in California prisons as a political prisoner. He's currently a building community power fellow at Community Justice Exchange. And he's also a director of advocacy and outreach for First Followers Reentry Program in um, Champaign, Illinois. Uh, Jim also contributed to the book, Rattling the Cages. Uh, and then not able to be with us tonight is artist and author Vic Liu, who co-created uh, The Warehouse and authored the sex ed book, Bang, Masturbation for All Genders and Abilities. Um, sorry that Vic can't be here, but I know we're gonna have a great conversation. Uh, thanks so much for being here, Eric. James, I'm gonna go ahead and pass off to y'all. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, before we get started, do you want me to call you Jim or James? Uh, James, if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, so James, I want to start with, firstly, thank you for being with me. Um, I want to start with, if you could just give a brief overview um, about 
the SLA, your participation in it. And then, um, yeah, really just that, like what the SLA was to you. And then like what, what led, led to you being locked up. Okay. Thanks, uh, Eric. And thanks Liberty for inviting me to be on here. I've been watching some of the really dynamic interviews you've been having with other former political prisoners. I think it's a great platform here and it's really an honor to be part of it. So I'm going to make that make that question a little bit bigger, yeah. but um, so I came to politics really around 1969, 1970, when I was a student at UC Santa Barbara, and I was also a potential draftee into the U.S. military, and that fear of that draft is kind of what got me into politics and into looking at what was going on. Um, during my time at UC Santa Barbara, the students, among other things, burnt down the Bank of America to the ground. And although I had actually gone to bed by the time they did the burning, I was still was there in spirit. And that really kind of changed my idea about struggle. And particularly when subsequent to that, we had a military occupation by the National Guard of the student community there. We had a curfew. But that really educated me about the nature, nature of the state and really kind of triggered a lifelong political involvement. Uh, by 1974, I mean, I had done various things, but I had moved to Berkeley, Oakland, California. And on February 4th, 1974, a group called the Symbionese Liberation Army kidnapped Patty Hearst, who was an heiress to the Hearst Media fortune really one of the mega billionaires of the day of the day and this was really a national news story and the police and the fbi chased down the symbionese liberation army who were holding patty hearst not so much for ransom but they wanted her family to donate six million dollars to give food to the poor which they did do. And I went to one of the food distributions they did in East Oakland, where they pulled in all these big trucks full of food and they're throwing chickens and bread. I realized they got the food off the back of the truck. And so <laughs> it, it, it did, it did highlight the fact the ruling class could do if they really wanted to. Not long after that, the SLA who didn't really have an infrastructure or a proper organizational context, got trapped in a house in South Los Angeles. And on May 17th, uh, 1974, they were, um, sorry, 1975, they were burned alive by the LAPD. Six of them, three of them escaped, Bill and Emily Harris and Patricia Hurst. They left there with nothing. They approached us, um, my partner at the time, Kathleen Solia, perhaps known to some people as Sarah Jane Olson, and they, ne they, they, they needed help. So we provided support for them. Well, we helped them get housing. You know, we basically looked after them as best we could. We weren't really part of the SLA. We weren't really part of their political project, but we also felt a responsibility to not allow them to also be massacred by law enforcement. We knew a couple of the people that w had died in the house in LA. So that's kind of how we had a connection to particularly Bill and Emily Harris. And that's why they came, came to us. So we did, we kind of hid them out for a year and a half. During that time, we also then became engaged in other activities, including a couple of bank robberies. And by September of 1975, Bill and Emily were captured. And myself and Kathy, we we fled and we stayed underground for a long time. Um, I, was, I was on the run for 27 years from federal possession of explosive charges. Um, later on, I got charged with a bank robbery. And um, finally in 2002, 
Um, I was captured in Cape Town, South Africa. I'll talk a little bit more about what my life was like on the run, but I'm just kind of giving you a, a frame, a, a framework. I just would say that during those 27 years, I mean, I spent a lot of time rethinking my politics and also involved in a whole lot of political activity, particularly in Southern Africa. Um, thank you. So one of the things that I was interested in is that I read in your chapter in Rattling the Cages, you mentioned that there was a group called Revolutionary Action, I believe, who was doing things and that some of them got arrested and you went to visit them, like you would visit them inside. And then later on, after the uh, after the pigs burned burned your friends alive, you ended up joining the SLA. So I want to know, like, what what caused you like to decide, like, now is the time for arms? Like the, all this movement's going on. Like, what was the final thing for you? You were like, I can no longer sit on the sideline during this. Well, really, for me, it was more. Uh, it was more just the the you know the, the 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 rage and kind of wanting to to fight back against you know against the force that had killed the you know the 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 people in L in L A. And I I don't think we had a detailed political strategy it was more like this is this is too much i have to do something to help these people and it kind of spun a little out of control to be honest we didn't have like a we didn't really have like a tight organization and because i mean i think it's important to recognize that the patty hearst kidnapping was like a lead story on the national news almost every night you know they would lead some of these newscasts would lead with day 73 of the of um, of the captivity of patricia hearst it was a probably one of the most intense person hunts in fbi history and we're sitting there with almost no resources and no money trying to figure out how are we going to escape this and how are we going to fight back and it would so we were really kind of in a pretty desperate situation and we couldn't just you know go knocking on people's doors and saying hey can you help us with a little food or something you know it was it was very scary very dangerous um so for people that are listening in i i think i think the equivalent today would be like if like paris hilton got kidnapped uh by a revolutionary group like just a really famous heiress would that be about right yeah mm -hmm. yeah um so for people that don't know, can you explain why, especially in the 60s and 70s and 80s, bank appropriations were so common and so necessary? I think what we need to say is that people, particularly because of the war in Vietnam, people who were really committed to ending that war felt a need to take up arms in solidarity with the with the liberation fighters in Vietnam. So there was there was different schools of thought about how to end the war in Vietnam. Some people you know wanted to do you know more pacifist kind of things and also just campaign to bring the the troops home from Vietnam. But other people felt that the Vietnam War was part of a much bigger structure of US imperialism and that we either needed to fight back against that by building a stronger anti-imperialist network or committing our making the same level of commitment that we saw the Vietnamese people making putting their lives on the line to fight against US imperialism so that's so those people who were involved in military action in solidarity with the Vietnamese freedom fighters it wasn't so easy to survive economically so a lot of times people resorted to robberies in order to survive and i think we also kind of copycatted a little bit some of the guerrilla movements of latin america that survived through what they call expropriations particularly the tupamaros of of uruguay um also the revolutionary army of argentina so there was a whole international network of guerrilla focused liberation forces that believed that this was a moment to fight back against U.S. imperialism and that armed struggle was the way to do that. I love that. Um, 
something you mentioned was that when you were when you saw your friends or these comrades killed by the police, it was just it was too much. Um, that's what that's what happened with me as well. To where when I saw the cops kill Michael Brown, the young black man in Ferguson, Missouri, I was like, this is enough. This is enough. And so I did my action. Um, and I was underground for a grand total of six days before I was <laughs> arrested with multiple machine guns. So I don't want to, I obviously I can't dig into all the details, but I'd really like to know how, how you even start underground and then how it lasts for almost three decades. Well, I think it's important to recognize that the world was very different in 1975, right? There was no internet. So in the U.S., it was fairly easy for someone, particularly a white person, and I was an educated white person, so I can pass as a respectable person when I needed to. It was pretty easy to move from one part of the country to another and just kind of disappear. And just to give you an idea, <clears throat> I spent a small portion of that time living in Wisconsin. Okay, Wisconsin did not have pictures on their driver's licenses. So let alone facial recognition, let alone all the other stuff that we have to contend with now, it's like it it was it was never really very difficult, particularly for an educated white person to kind of slip into the cracks of the system because they didn't have a way of tracking people from one state to another. There was no national database of driver's license or IDs. They had no way of taking your picture and comparing it to everybody else that was on their, in their database. So once you could get yourself, so I, when I left San Francisco, which my charges were out of San Francisco, I moved to Seattle and I stayed there for about a year and a half. And, but I, but Seattle was still too close to San Francisco. So every once in a while I'd be walking down the street or I'd be going somewhere and I'd see somebody I knew from the Bay, from the Bay area. I mean, I duck in a, duck out the way and they never saw me but i realized if i'm going to do this in the long run i need to be farther away so i moved to milwaukee and then after that we moved to uh moved to minneapolis and i stayed in minneapolis from 77 to 82 and there is when i really started to become involved as an activist i was an above ground activist doing anti doing solidarity work with the liberation struggles in Southern Africa. I helped start an organization there called the Twin Cities Committee for the Liberation of Southern Africa. We work closely with freedom fighters from Zimbabwe and from South Africa, doing political education and raising material aid for, for um, refugees and guerrilla fighters in, in, the, in, the, in the camps in Mozambique. That's why. <laughs> Do uh so one of the things I've always wondered, and I spoke to um I've spoken to others, but like I spoke to David Gilbert about it too. Do you feel like back then, like during those time periods, that there was more like societal understanding about why the revolution was happening, like why this uprest was happening compared to now? Like or a media, like to where the media was maybe more understanding or the community was? Because it doesn't seem like the snitch culture existed back then like it does right now where everyone's just dying to tell on someone would, would you say like that adds up or am i just mis misreading things yeah i think that probably adds up i mean one of the things that i've been focusing on this a lot i'm doing actually doing a research project on this at the moment but is that i think the movement at that time had a much stronger sense of international solidarity yeah so we knew for example we all read we read Che Guevara, we read Fanon, you know, we read, we read, uh, <clears throat> we, had, we read international riot writers and we, we had a common kind of intellectual culture and an understanding. We knew about the freedom fighters in, in Mozambique. We knew about freedom fighters in Algeria. We knew about the organizations in Latin America. That was just kind of 
common to the left culture of the day, whether you were a, a, a guerrilla fighter or an above ground organizer, it was just part of how you how you developed a political consciousness. And maybe the Vietnam War triggered that internationalist consciousness, but nonetheless, it was very powerful and almost universal. Now today, we don't really see that, or it's certainly marginalized. You know, I mean, people, I've been, you know, I've interviewed, I've interviewed a number of younger activists about what are they, who do they, who do they look to for as theoretical guidance? Or is there anybody outside the United States that they connect to as somebody that has something to inform them about? And what I usually find is a blank face. Mm. You know, that people, that it hasn't occurred to them that maybe people in Southern Africa, maybe people in Asia, maybe people in Europe have political theories and political lessons that we could learn from. And I'm not saying that's universal because there are certain sectors of the movement that are more internationalist than other than others, particularly people that are dealing with climate, with uh, the climate catastrophe. But it's not even in abolitionist circles. I've found that abolitionists are not very internationalist in in overall. Sure. Once again, there's exceptions to those to that situation, but they're they're not really thinking a lot thinking on a global context, and a lot of stuff becomes very localized. And when we're dealing with a system of global capitalism, global imperialism, it's not enough to have mutual aid in your neighborhood. It's just not enough. We have to find ways to be making ties to people outside the U.S. and building and building with them in other in other ways and and that's so that for me is part of the movement of the back in the day because i've been interviewing a lot of people that were active in different ways back in the uh, back in the you know back in the 70s and even 80s and all of them kind of had that internationalist consciousness but they also recognize that it's not so prevalent today as it was and i mean you know you take like the black panther party for example you know they had international uh they had international chapter if you like in algeria i mean they had an internationalist perspective huey newton had this thing rightly or wrongly he had this thing called intercommunalism which was a way of talking about how the how imperialism functioned at a global level i mean these were things that even organizations that um you might not associate with internationalism really thought a lot about. Yeah, that's interesting. I just, uh, I just did a talk in Oakland with Claude and Donna and yeah. they could not say a single sentence without bringing up someone in Cuba, Palestine, Vietnam. They're right, right, still, right. That structure is still there. Um, do you see any connections or any similarities between the Palestinian like solidarity movement today in the Vietnamese like solidarity back then, or is it, is it just completely different? Well, I think, look, the, the, the movements that have emerged in solidarity with Palestine, I mean, they're, they're, they're amazing and it's a wonderful development to see. Um, I think it's a little bit early to decide what the impact of those movements is gonna be. A, we don't know what the impact of those movements is going to be on the situation in Palestine. Because so far, despite all the things we've done, Netanyahu, Biden, etc., they're not moving on this shit, right? They're not one inch. They're they're not they're not prepared to compromise. But I mean, we fought the Vietnam War with the same result for years and years and years, you know, and and I think one of the key differences between the two movements is that A, in Vietnam, we had US troops fighting and we had US troops dying. Okay. So that provided leverage for people to get people here involved because they didn't want their children or themselves to be sent off to Vietnam to die. So one of the, and you have to remember that beginning in 1965, the U.S. had a military draft. So everybody that was over 18 had to register for the draft. 
and then you you know it, it, it was like luck of the draw whether you got chosen or not but nixon president nixon in 1971 i believe it was switched from the draft to the lottery oh so you got so everybody that was of draft age your birthday got lottery and you got rated from one to 365 so if you were one to a hundred you were pretty likely to get uh brought into the military if you were 100 to i don't know 175 you were kind of 50 50 and if you're over 175 you were you know you were out of the picture so what that did is it demobilized part of the anti-war movement because those people that had high high lottery numbers they didn't have to worry about it anymore and their families didn't have to worry about it anymore. So that that was a big thing in terms of demobilizing the anti-war movement. Now, of course, we don't have anything like that here. <clears throat> and we don't have people from the US getting sent off to uh, you know, to the West Bank and getting killed. And so um so I don't know what will happen with the solidarity movement. I mean, I do know that we've seen some pretty big mobilizations around mm-hmm. global issues in the last two and a half decades, beginning with the anti-WTO movement, um, the Battle for Seattle in 1999. You know, we had tens of thousands of people involved in this, and then all of a sudden it disappeared. Same thing happened with Occupy. It disappeared. We never built us, we never built a sustainable structure to turn that into a movement or an organization that could fight imperialism people just went back into their normal life after a certain period of time and i think some of that has also happened with um you know with with black lives matter and with the murder of black people by the police i mean where is that movement now where's the structure we just lost uh, eric We, we did, you're right. Um, hopefully Eric will sign back on here and uh, continue the conversation with us. Um, oh, I'm, I'm gonna, can I fill the space a little? Please do. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm really interested in the questions that's Eric, that Eric's asking me and I've been doing, I've been doing a lot of research lately on trying to compare, you know, internationalism across the, from the 60s and 70s and even early 80s as compared to what we've seen since the year 2000. And for me, I mean, one of the things that is a constant source of wonder, a constant source of concern is what kind of organizations are we building? I mean, in, in and one of the things that's been important in looking at that history has been the disappearance of the Soviet Union. Now, I was never Mm -hmm. a big supporter of the Soviet Union. I was not a Stalinist. I was not a Khrushchevian or anything like that. I didn't didn't like the brand of socialism that the Soviet Union had and that they marketed. But the Soviet Union was a big supporter of national liberation forces for, for good reasons and bad reasons. But nonetheless, virtually all the national liberation struggles from Vietnam to Southern Africa to Central America, they all relied on the Soviet Union for a certain level of material and ideological support. They also provided an opportunity for national liberation movements to play one superpower off against another. So if they didn't like what they were getting from the U.S., they could go to the Soviet Union. If they didn't like what they got from the Soviet Union, they could go to the U.S. And both of those superpowers were kind of vying to be able to have some kind of hegemony over these national liberation movements and also influence the the way in which they ruled once they took once they took power. Now, when the Soviet Union collapsed once and for all in 1991, all of a sudden we had one superpower. We didn't really have a, a 
another force in the world that could counter in some way the U.S. And I think it also impacted the ability of activists to imagine something other than U.S. imperialism existing. Because, I, I mean, for me, I grew up politically in the Cold War era, and I always knew it was possible to do something different than what the U.S. did. And what I had to see was the Soviet Union. I go, well, that's not so great, but that shows maybe we could do something different. But once the Soviet Union disappeared, then we we didn't really have another another kind of universe that we could relate to in order to see how do we build a how do we build yet another universe that's better than the Soviet Union, but that's not the U.S. that's not U.S. imperialism. So for me, that's an interesting kind of historical component of, of the issues that we're talking about. I don't know if that makes sense, Liberty. Hey, Eric. Sorry to lose you for a minute there. Oh my God, that was so annoying. I'm so sorry. It's okay. We were we were chatting a little bit about the shift in in context for revolutionary movements with. I was uh, listening to it. <laughs> oh, you were listening. Oh, great. So you didn't really oh. miss anything. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna dip back out and let y'all take the conversation from there. All right, I'm jumping back in with the questions. Sorry, James. Um, so you're you go underground, and at some point you get offered to go to Africa to teach, correct? <laughs> I was living in Minneapolis, working with people from Zimbabwe. And Zimbabwe became independent in 1980. And so some of the Zimbabweans that were there offered to help me go to Zimbabwe and become a teacher. But they also, <clears throat> they were aware of my situation. And so they, it was an act of solidarity on their part as well. So that was in, in, finally in 1982. And I mean, it's also interesting the challenges of getting a passport were a little bit different there too. <laughs> <laughs> so you could still kind of use the, you know, the sort of dead baby kind of approach. So I went to, um, oh, I went and I went to um, Iowa, I believe. And I looked in, uh, you know, I went into a library and read back newspapers. And what do you, what I was looking for is a child that died um, sort of less than age three or four, but also that was born in a state that was different than where they died. Because they had state level records, but so they could check on, they could check to see if somebody died in that state, but they couldn't check to see if you died in a, in a neighboring state. I have always wondered this too. That's so neat. <clears throat> <It's crazy. laughs> um, question about did did being underground because when you're underground i assume like there's there's always the risk of arrest or attack did that ever feel like its own mental prison or were you just prepared and ready like happy to live life um well there were there were a few moments of panic where something would happen like the police would visit somebody back in california or something would happen. They called at one point they were gonna they were talking about calling a grand jury and pulling my parents in front of the grand jury. <clears throat> um so there was moments like that, but overall, and once again, I mean, there's an awful lot of white skin privilege involved in this, you know, that it's pretty easy for me to to blend in. It's pretty easy for me to at those at that point, it was pretty easy for me to get employed. Um it's pretty easy for me to get uh, hired as a as a contractor. I did a house painting, for example. Um, so I, I it, it was it just wasn't that survival was challenging, but it wasn't that difficult for me. I also didn't have any serious, you know, physical disabilities that kind of limited my ability to move or my ability to do certain kinds of work. So for the longest period of time after I got out of Seattle really for the next kind of 20 years it, it wasn't 
it wasn't that horrific. I mean, it just wasn't like, it wasn't like I was waking up every day and looking out the window to see if the cops were there. Okay. Okay. And it so, was like that for the first year or so yeah, yeah. because you're still, and also because the case itself was in the media a lot. So there was a, always a concern that um, something, you know, that your picture might pop up in the paper or something. I often feel like I was born a little too late. <laughs> My goodness. Um, so after, after, I guess, a decade in Africa, give or take, you end up getting arrested by the African authorities and put in an African jail or prison. Can you talk about like how that arrest happened and then what the situation was like in the African prison as well? Sure. Uh, I was actually, uh, I was actually in Southern Africa for 18 years, right? Oh, Jesus. Sorry. Uh, 11 years in South Africa, seven years in Zimbabwe. Um, I don't, I don't know how they, I think I, I was trying to make some, I was trying to have some, calls with lawyers and maybe making some kind of a deal or something. And I think they just tapped one of the phone calls, oh. but I still, I still don't really know how I got caught. Um, one of the things that happened was that the day before I got arrested, two people came to my front door, a man and a woman, white man and white woman. And they said they were marketing a new line of wine, wine, and they wanted me to know they had two bottles there and they wanted me to know they wanted me to tell them which one of those bottles I thought had a better design. And what they did is they handed me the bottle. And the minute they handed me the bottle, I thought to myself, these guys are taking my fingerprints. So I, tried, <laughs> so I tried to, so I tried to take the bottle and I, took my shirt tail and I kind of tried to <laughs> rub the finger rinse off and do all that kind of stuff. But, you know, we know that by that time, if they got into my front door, it was like all of You're done. So the next day, yeah, the, ne the next day, um, I, I was driving, I drove my seven-year-old son at the time home from cricket practice because he used to play cricket. That's what they play in San Diego. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, they, you know, when I got out of the car, they, a couple of guys came charging out of the bushes from across the street, and that was kind of that. But I will say this, that because I was a high-profile international fugitive and a white international fugitive, I got treated pretty, pretty softly. They actually didn't put, they actually told me later that they didn't want to put handcuffs on me in front of my children. Now that doesn't happen in the U.S. I can tell you. That. Right. Do you feel like you benefited from white privilege inside an African prison, or um, was it media privilege, like pristine pri privilege? Probably a little bit of both, but I was kept in a because I was a high-profile international person. Basically, I was kept in a medical unit. Okay, and. Um, it was okay. Um, How was the food? The food was shit. It was terrible. <laughs> it was way worse than you get beets every meal. Beets. Super, super food. Ugh. Hot beets. Um, and then they had something. And so at about, they lock you up like about 4 or 5 p.m. for the night and they'd give you about five slices of white bread and they had something that they that you could put on the bread which i still never quite figured out what it was it wasn't butter it wasn't margarine it wasn't shortening but it was something it was in that family it was in that distant relative yeah distant relative. so but you know but you because you know you got that's got to last you for now you know, 15 hours till you get Eesh. breakfast and breakfast, you get uh, hot porridge and some more bread. Yeah. Very similar. And then lunch, breakfast. lunch, you got cabbage or beets and, and some and little scraps of meat. Yeah. Okay. The food was, the food was, I mean, the food was worse than I got in, in any, any U.S. prison. Okay. Um, 
So, but I'll just say this: that yeah, I mean the the prison population in South Africa. I mean they 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 like me. You know, you I was a, I I was a freedom fighter to them. You know, yeah. and to us. <laughs> so, I. I've been wildly interested in this. Like when you hear about people that get arrested overseas and they're brought to America or brought back to the States, what was the plane situation like? Like, how were you flown? Was it a military jet? Was it United Airlines? Like, what was that situation like? They put me on a commercial flight in, in basically just in wrist shackles. And then they had some kind of a jacket <clears throat> that they put on me that covered up the shackles oh but it, and then i had and there was either so there was an fbi agent that sat next to me this woman that had been tracking my case for 15 years or something and she kept asking me all kinds of questions which i kept not answering and then uh there was another there was another uh i'm trying to remember what he wasn't FBI. I can't remember what he was. Some, you know, some, you know, U.S. global police guy who was on there. There was another woman who was also being flown back at the same time, um, and uh, so I remember, she, huh? It was a she, it was a female prisoner. Yeah, so she was being flown back at the same time. That's interesting. She was from Oregon. Um, I, 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 I didn't know her. Um, so I, but I, what I remember the most about the flight was that she, she said, well, I'm going to do you a big favor and I'm going to let you use the silverware. Silverware. So that was the last time I used a metal fork for the next right. few years. <laughs> what, what about if you had to use the restroom? Did they just stand up with you and put the jacket over your arms? Yeah, and then they'd stand outside the door and that's neat. That's neat. So when you land in the States, you get found you get found guilty. Your first pretrial spot, was that a federal pretrial spot? Yeah, Dublin. Oh you were held at Dublin? Was it a men's prison back then? There was always a a pretrial spot in Dublin for men. Oh, I didn't know that. We could actually look out the window and see the women. I thought that was nice. Um, <laughs> just, just kidding. Uh, when you're when you're in this pretrial, because I I assume it was still a high profile case. Um, were you like were you allowed to be in general population, or did they just dump you in the shoe? I was in general population. Okay, and were you able like to see your lawyer and like try to fight your case? Yeah, I mean, basically, basically, there was already a deal that had been cooked up. So. Oh, okay, okay. Um, someone asked a question on the webinar chat, and I think it's really relevant. When you were arrested, like, did the South African cunt or how do I how do I want to word this? Was there ever a chance of you like staying in South Africa? Like, did they have to send you to the USA? Could they have said no? Um, they could have, but they did have. They had just recently signed an extradition treaty with the U.S. So okay. that kind of. Yeah, I was trying to read the chat, but it then oh. muted me. So, um, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, they had recently signed an extradition agreement with the u.s okay so so that was really a possibility when so you're in dublin you're fighting your case you get you already have like your situation set up like the deal set up it took uh, it took 19 months to get the thing finally okay was that a when you were there in dublin how did that compare like our pretrial to the south african pretrial or south african like medical Oh, Dublin was like paradise. Like paradise? Dublin was a soft place. I mean, there was no, I mean, you didn't really have a big yard or anything, but it, it was a soft place here. Okay. And so then they move you to Lompoc. 
Yeah. Can you tell me about like what that felt to you? Like you supported people in prison in the past. You were a part of a revolutionary movement where hundreds of you were getting locked up. How did you feel when you were actually like, I am going to prison? And then when you actually got on the yard, like, did that go away? Did your did the feelings you had or the expectations you had match what you had thought was gonna happen? Stuff like that. I didn't I didn't really have an idea what prison my idea of prison was, you know, having read the prison letters of George Jackson and shit. Yes. You know, so when I landed in prison, I expected because really I mean, I haven't been in the U.S. for 20 years. You know, I wasn't really, I didn't really know what political consciousness existed in the U.S. much, you know. Um, I had been back a couple of times, but I never really interacted with ordinary folks. So I didn't have really a clue about, you know, the ways in which people just dealt with stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. So I have to say that I was pretty shocked at the low level of political awareness of people. Um, and that... Um, well, I mean, a lot of them, you know, this was like, this was like 20 plus years since, you know, my, my stuff happened. A lot of them didn't know much about where I came from or anything. So it just didn't register with them. A few people, I remember a couple people came up to me and said, they thanked me for the food that the SLA gave their family. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but, that's uh, sweet. but, uh, but other than that, you know, there wasn't a lot, um, yeah, I, did. I just had to figure, I had to take it as it came. Now I'll say, you know, that experience in the feds and the Lompoc as a medium was way, way, way easier than the state. We're going to get to that. I mean, Weird. yeah. Did, uh, I, I've heard about, like, I've never been to a California federal prison, um, but I like, you hear people talk. Was the <laughs> racial dynamics, even though they might not have been as aggressive as Cali State, it's still a Cali prison, were they still as enforced in that medium or did you have more leeway? No, it was, it was very loose. Um, oh. I could basically associate with anybody I wanted to associate with. Really? Yeah. Damn. Yeah. I that mean, what, no, it certainly wasn't that way in the state, but I mean, like I, you know, I used to play tennis, you know, with, with black friends. I walked the track with them. I hang out with them, play chess, do all that. Um, there was no, the only thing that was segregated was the chow hall. But other than that, space was not segregated. We had integrated basketball games. I mean, the whole thing was, yeah, it was. I mean, you know, of course, I mean, a lot of whites self-segregated. Sure. But but I mean, I, you know, I didn't do that. And nobody nobody came up to me and said, hey, you better stop hanging out with those people. I, I never. That's fucking I, sweet. I never, I never once. I never once in the feds had any kind of a racial threat from somebody. I had about 7,000 racial threats. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, I know. I know you did. So I, 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 I heard yours. Yeah, no. Um. So when you land, it's been 20 years. You've been out of America for goddamn forever. Did you have a support team? Like when you landed, like, and when you got put in the feds, were people, were people rallying behind you? Were you getting letters and books and canteen? Yeah, yeah, I had, I had a lot of, uh, I got, I got a letter almost every day. I got so many oh, letters. Yeah, I mean, I'm a family. Then I had a lot of people in South Africa were sending me letters. A lot of my ex friends from the, you know, from the states were sending me letters. Um, they were sending in books. I mean, I never, I was never short of books. My 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 family was particularly strong. Um, Good. you know, my my partner and my mother in law, and my mother also. My mother was like, let's see, in 2002, my mother was 80, she was 89, but she was still, she was still sharp. So she came, when I was in Dublin, she came every Sunday to, to visit. She visited every week? Yeah. God bless her. She well, lived in, warrior. she lived like about she lived about an hour away, maybe. She didn't drive. She had a wonderful friend that drove her every every week. And I say, I'll say this. So my mother, she's about four foot nine, right? And so when she came into she came to the my first court appearance, and 
a reporter from the San Francisco Chronicle came up and asked her some question about it. What does it feel like to see your son here indicted for murder, blah, 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 blah. And my mother just looked at her and said, drop dead. Yes. Yes. Your 89-year-old mom. Yes. <laughs> I think so, my mom's watching right now, so I'm going to say hello to my mom, and I hope that she someday does the exact same thing if necessary. Um, Something that I noticed that was really hurtful when I first got locked up was that people might support me, but they kind of treated my wife like shit. Uh, they treat her, I don't want to say like a like a secondary creature, but like as if her say and her trauma and her fears and all that was not real, wasn't valid. Did you feel as if your partner was like respected and like treated the way you thought they should be? Were they supported also? I, th I think so. Um... Because we had lived together in Southern Africa for a long time. We had built up, both of us had built up independent sets of friends and, and comrades. Okay. And when, when I got arrested, I mean, people just rallied to her, to her support. I mean, and see my family, our family, our children, they stayed in South Africa the whole time I was incarcerated. Oh, they, they didn't. Did. Come, they didn't come back to the U.S. And why? Because we got treated with respect in South Africa. So when when I was arrested, the principal of my youngest son, his school, and he was in third grade, I believe. The principal sent a letter home to all the parents in the school saying, "Lonnie's father has just been arrested." Please show him love and support in this time of Jesus. trauma. <laughs> that's so that's amazing. why that's why we did not want our children to come and live in the US because we knew that they wouldn't get anything like that. That that's that's incredible. I never even thought about that. Um, so you do approximately a year and a half, I believe, at Von Pock, Um, and then you go to the state. Is that right? Yeah. And so what uh where do you first land when you hit Cali State Prison? Um was that high desert? No, DVI. Okay. Tracy. Is uh that DVI is that like a designation center? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so then they decide they decide like you're going to high desert or do they put you somewhere else and you get transferred? Uh, no, they just sent me to high desert. Okay. So would you describe like vaguely just so the people listening can understand like a general overview of the California state prison system. <laughs> <laughs> Racist well, shit. <laughs> I came from South. I came from South Africa, which was an apartheid state. And when I left South Africa, you know, they had dismantled apartheid. I'm not saying it was a total liberation, but they dismantled apartheid. And when I moved to high desert, I went back to apartheid. It was total segregation. Everything was segregated. All spaces segregated. You can't, the tables in the yard are segregated. The showers are segregated. The phones are segregated. The basketball court segregated. If you're playing at the white end of the basketball court and your ball goes over half court, you got to stop at half court and ask somebody to pick the ball up and throw it to you. Um, you know, you can't, it's just, it's just total segregation. You, if, if you're in a day room, the day room has an imaginary line in the middle and the sure whites and the, the whites and the southerners, southern Mexicans, so-called, and the Pisces, so-called, and the Native Americans are on one side and the black people and the northern Mexicans are on the other side. And you can't if you want to talk to somebody on the other side, you go to the boundary and you shout across this imaginary line. That sounds very much more like my experience. Yeah just a nightmare um so one of the things that I, I think is so relevant in this conversation is that you were a wildly anti-racist white man when you entered prison and you were confronted with just a thousand people that that enforced on a segregated code um did you face like problems from the white prisoners because of your politics 
And did you face any solidarity or receive any solidarity from the black prisoners? Um, I think the white prisoners had a mixed attitude toward me because part of what I was involved with involved <laughs> putting bombs under police cars. It's tricky. It's tricky. And they like they liked that. Yeah. I didn't boast about that. I I did wasn't particularly wasn't something I was proud of because I don't think it was a good thing to do for a whole lot of reasons. But um it probably saved me from getting you know really attacked by the white supremacists. So the white population was kind of divided about how to handle me. I also learned that, I, I mean, I learned about kind of treating people with a certain amount of respect can get you a long ways, but it might not take you all the way. But it'll get some people off your ass if you don't just confront them every time they want to talk shit to you, you know? Or every time they want to say something. You know? One um, of the hard lessons I had to learn when I first got locked up, I thought I could change prison. I thought I could rally everyone and revolutionize the whole yard and we were going to take over the prison and we were all going to be radicals and revolutionaries. And I learned quickly that not only was that not the case, that me trying to do that case would cause lots of problems. People weren't trying to hear that shit. Did you ever try to, like, I don't want to say radicalize, but have these conversations and were you incredibly disappointed when they did not come to fruition? I really never had that expectation. Okay. Um, I, I didn't think that uh, particularly the white people in the prison were going to be, um, we're going to be, we're going to become revolutionaries or even be the best I could hope for them would be for them not to be uh <laughs> not to be uh aggressive white supremacists and be stabbing people that's that's kind of that 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 that, that was that was enough that was enough for me different parameters for different areas in your life <laughs> and, and and see i mean the thing is you know i'm yeah i mean i'm i'm 55 you know i've been i've been around this but i've also been i've also had 3 years in the feds where i've got a much better idea of what the white population is like. Mm -hmm. So the white, the white population in Lompoc, they weren't organized. But the, that's not to say that there was no white supremacists. That you know, the first night I got there, somebody with a big tattoo of Hitler on his arm came up to me and asked me if I needed anything. I said, mm, I I'm good, I'm brother. <laughs> I'm good. But <laughs> so you know, like, um, but uh, so I had, I, I by that time I, you know, I had a feel for what this population was like. I'm trying to, I'm trying to survive, you know, I'm you trying laying to down. get through there, you know, and um, yeah. Did you ever, because you pointed out, like you came in and you were in your fifties and oftentimes like people will fall back on, on older prisoners. Did you ever have a situation where someone brought violence to you or was it mostly just like threats or shit talk or nothing? Little shit talk. That's about it. Okay. Because, see, here's one of the things. I mean, gangs have rules, right? So one of the rules of the gang of a white supremacist gangs was we don't we don't beat up the elders. Okay, that's why I was. So, thinking. They, so if somebody wanted to beat me up, they're going to get beat up, regardless of who I was. I'm a white guy. You don't beat me up. The white older guy, give him some space. Did right. you get bunk, bunk? What's that? Did they give you the bottom bunk in yourself? <laughs> well the guy I sailed up with most of the time he had a you know he he couldn't really climb up you know he had he was disabled so fair enough fair enough um during your time there i read this in rattling the cages you mentioned that one of the things that would help you cross racial barriers was sports and right. that was a huge thing for me as well it revolved around soccer and nfl um, can you talk about like the advantages or the benefits of like this sports knowledge and how it helped you like build bonds or relationships with people across racial lines? 
Oh, it helped bond relationships not only across racial lines, but also with the white supremacists. I can sit, and, I can sit and talk football, basketball with all these guys, and you know it was a common language. And you know the, we weren't going to have. And it, it's it's also interesting how white supremacists don't mind cheering for LeBron James or Kobe Bryant, you know? right? <laughs> you know, right? If if he's a if they're supporting their if they support the Lakers, they're going to cheer for Kobe Bryant regardless of whether he's black or not. So there's this whole weird kind of dynamic, but. Yeah. So uh, the other thing is that I played basketball um, and I could still play a little bit when I got to prison. So I played a lot of basketball because that gave me a certain prestige because I'm not a big guy. Right. I'm not a physical guy, but I could play basketball. And so that gave me a bit of prestige in the, you know, in the hierarchy of toxic masculinity. I mean, I'm, you know, to be able to play a sport and be competent and be aggressive and all that shit. It, you know, it's it's a it's plus points, right? Aggression is rewarded in prison. Like it is a it is a point system. Um, what's your team? What's your NFL team? Do you have one? I mean, I've always been an Oakland Raiders supporter, so oh. I, mean, I can't. I, oh God, I'm from Kansas City. If you didn't know, um, Chiefs through and through. So I hate the Raiders. Uh did you guys in your dorms or in the rec center? Was there a designated sport TV or TV room or did like one specific race have games on? How did that work? Uh, well, it was different in different places, but mostly it was by race. So in the state, in high desert, like the white guys would have the games on still? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Did you ever play the tickets? I actually, I actually worked in the in the feds, I worked in the, I was a computer teacher. So we got, so we printed out the tickets. <laughs> yes. One of my, uh, one of my hustles was typing up the tickets for people on the typewriter. And then that would right, be copies go. of them. <laughs> I see somebody's asking in the buy in the chat, play the tickets. It means you're betting on the football scores or. Yep. It, uh, and I apologize, Carlos. Um, it means gambling. You're, you're betting on the games, you're betting on the spreads. And that is a very lucrative thing in prison. And it's also a way that some people get severely hurt if they do not have the money to pay. Um, it's also a great way to, you know, to take your mind off your, the shit that is happening to you. <laughs> one of the best ways. When, when you were inside, did you ever try to, because you're, as you said, you're a highly educated person. And my experience was that, that I didn't meet many people that had college educations or had read uh, extensively and things like that did you ever use that to like to help other prisoners did you ever use it to help them legally or intellectually or emotionally in any way totally i see that question just popped into the chat too. oh yeah so you're right i spent most of my time in prison being a a, tu a, a tutor a ged tutor uh-huh um and so you know i worked with guys a lot um when i was in the feds when I was in Dublin, um, I started an ESL class. I also started a Spanish as a second language class. Um, and I, so, and I did some, I tried to do some workshops um, when I was in the state, you know, when I was in the state, I was in the, I was the teacher's aide to the, to the GED teacher. And one day the GED teacher was in the middle of doing math and she couldn't do math for shit. So she said, I'm going to just let Mr. Kilgore teach the math class just out of the blue. So from no, there, that, from, from there, that completely changed my, cause I was a math teacher in, in, in Zimbabwe. Um, so, oh. I, so I, I mean, I could do the, this stuff in my sleep. So I, so I just took over and I ran the class, but then what I did was I asked her if we could run a workshop because this was the time of the 2008 global economic crisis. So one of the things I did in Southern Africa is I ran economic uh, economics classes for trade unionists and community organizations on big economic issues like the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, the IMF, oh. because these were organizations that impacted the working class in South Africa. So I knew how to I knew how to take these complicated policies 
and make them accessible to people because the people I was teaching in South Africa, most of them English was a third, fourth, fifth language. So I had to make sure. Uh oh, James, I think you froze up a little if you can hear me. Okay, there we go. Um, so I had wanted to do this workshop and I, I'm not sure where I got cut off, but so I wanted to, I told her I wouldn't br break these people up by race, but I was going to just count off. And she said, well, oh, I don't know about this. This is pretty scary. Blah, blah, blah. I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go around to every student in here and I'm going to ask them if it's okay if we do this, if we do these groups non-racialized, you know, just at random. So I went around to every student in there and they all agreed. So we did this amazing workshop and it, it you know, it's just, it was a role play workshop where one group of people had to be uh, an organization that represented African countries. Another group had to be the United Nations. Another group had to be the United States corporate, corporate America. And then we taught, we threw out policies and then we had to, each group had to say, how is this going to affect them? Um, if we put the, if we put this into if we put this into play, was if they privatized, if they um, <clears throat> did free trade, et cetera, et cetera, how is this going to, how is this going to impact them? So we did this amazing, did a really a, a fabulous workshop. And, um, and uh, one of the guys in there, white supremacist guy, he told me that he had gone into a, he had had a visit that the weekend after our workshop. And he said, his, he said that, he told all his family about what was happening with the economic crisis. And they looked at him and they just said, how the hell do you know all this shit? You're sitting in yes. prison. Yes. So, yes. That, you know, that, so yeah, I did. I, I mean, I'm a teacher. That's, you know, that's what I've done for most of my life. So I tried to use that education as much as possible in the, in the prison. So yeah. there's a couple of things I really would like to talk about. Um, but so can we, so go go right, just, you right now. Okay. So one of the things I wanted to talk about was how being in Southern Africa changed my political perspective. Because okay. I, came to, I came to Southern Africa as somebody who supported the liberation movements and their armed struggle. And I saw that, I mean, Liberty was talking about this before, but I saw that when these armed liberation movements, particularly in Zimbabwe, took power, they became very undemocratic. And part of the reason they became undemocratic is because they came from a military tradition, which was very authoritarian anyway. And so they didn't have a practice of organizational democracy. And so that kind of started me thinking a little more critically about liberation movements and armed struggle as a strategy. Now, when I got to South Africa, I worked with trade unions and trade unions had an incredible culture of, demo of internal democracy, right? And so like if they ran a meeting, they would have a facilitator, a chairperson, but nobody would people would not interrupt each other they would not you know you know they would not name call they had a whole structure they would they would put motions onto the floor and they would discuss them they would they would they would also consider resolutions as an organization so somebody mm -hmm. would talk and they would and there would be global resolutions so somebody would for example in a national meeting of a trade unions they would come forward with a resolution to support the struggle for the liberation of Palestine, to support the Palestinian people. And then the organization as a whole would discuss it and then they would vote on it and then that would become part of their policy. And so, but it also, they also elected, they had shop floor leaders, they had shop stewards who were the people who represented say a unit within a factory. And that would be the, those would be the people that would go and negotiate with the bosses. But they, but they would be forced to be accountable to the to the workers that they represented. So they might be, so the workers would tell them, go and ask for a ten percent raise. Okay, 
they would they would then be bound by that decision to go and ask for a 10% raise. Now, if the if the bosses said, we'll give you a 7% raise, they could not say, okay, we'll take seven. They had to go back to the membership and say, the bosses are offering seven. What do you say? Let's talk about it. And then, so the, there was that whole structure of democracy, but it was important for me that there was structure, that there was leadership, but there was also plenty of space for people rank and file members to participate so not only did this exist in the, the level of the trade unions but it existed in the at the level of residences right so you had you had things called civic organizations which were organizations of residents and they had organizations at the street level organizations at the block level organizations at the area level, organizations at the city level, organization at the county level, the state level, and the national level. And each one of those would have an democ internal democratic structure and an elected leadership, and they would interact in different ways with their structure. But the national decisions would be taken and s taken all the way down to the grassroots to vote on and discuss, and then come all the way back up to the leadership. So for me, this was really an important kind of experience to see how this worked in a big organization like a national, you know, I worked for say the National Union of Metal Workers, right? Maybe they had 300,000 members, right? But they still had these structures of democracy and that the leadership adhered to. So for me, that was the most, and and I'm, and I'm, I mean, I would say that the, these people were not pacifists, right? But they didn't see armed struggle as the main as the main tactic of their struggle. It was but one tactic in their struggle. But more importantly, they they wanted to be engaged in mass action and build the power of their organization to impact uh, changes in the in the, in the in the society. Now, is that something that you thought was missing from the? Uh from the American radicals at that time? Um, well, I think it existed, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't as widespread as it, as, it, as it could have been. Yeah. And it wasn't as systematized as it could, as it could have been. But so when I, but now since I've been here post prison release, what I've found is, um, an antipathy to organization and an antipathy to leadership, particularly in abolitionist circles. People don't, you know, no, people don't want to have a leadership structure. And I'm not saying, I, I'm not trying to promote authoritarian leadership, but I've been in organizations where there's no structure, where you get to a meeting, there's no agenda, no, it's not clear who's running the meeting, and it just turns into chaos. So that's part of the lesson that I learned, and I think that people have, and I, and I think it impacted the way in which some of the mass uprisings that took place didn't stick because we didn't build structures that could enable those movements to stick together when everybody's in the street yeah we're together but what happens when everybody's not in the street what carries the movement forward then that's uh when i was talking about snitch culture earlier in my experiences the reason why we have and i'm just speaking for like my limited experience we uh the leadership ended up leaving or being removed because it, even in this small community they either I don't want to word this. They either became authoritarian or the group would have been so infiltrated with rats or people would suspect everyone of being rats. So even in our small affinity groups, there was no real trust. And if you don't trust the person next to you, you're not going to trust the person who's leading. Um, and so that's what I've seen. And they just crumble. They crumble from there. Um, I don't even know if that's on point with what you were saying. No, it's on point. But but what? so what's our problem i mean is the problem the 
is the problem our politics or is it the, or is our, the problem that the that the police are infiltrating and, and disrupting our organizations and we're not able to sustain them and it's probably both and i i think there's another macro problem of everyone we're not everyone but too many people want to be at the top too many people think that they are uh, the ones leading and everyone should listen to them and when it turns out that they're not that causes a lot of division um we can't have that many captains and then i'm with that yep you need a structure though you need to say okay this is our organization these are the these are the positions we have one two three four everybody can't be one of them everyone can't be one and you so, elect oh, you, choose, you, you elect them and they gotta and they're and they're accountable to you oh where's this next question but when you get a, but when you but if you're under a lot of pressure a lot of heat Sometimes that shit melts, you know? It melts. Um, you had brought up the abolition movement um, a minute ago, and some, like you were talking about how like you saw problems within it. How do you, or let me go back to the book, actually. And in your chapter, you talk about how something you saw that you disagreed with was what you labeled abolition puritanism or purism, where people, whoever makes this decision that it's either no prison at all, or I'm not going to do anything. And they end up abandoning people. And some, I've heard some argue that like reform is bad. And some say like, we have to make it as good as possible until we tear it down. Where, where do you stand on that today? Well, as somebody who's been in prison, <laughs> there is no way I'm going to say we don't need any reforms. If somebody's sitting in if somebody's sitting in solitary confinement for five years, I'm going to do whatever I can to get them out, right? Pure and simple. That There's nothing, I don't care what you want to call that, that's just basic solidarity. Um, you know, basic, so, I mean, I did a lot of, I did a lot of, you know, research work, ironically, on electronic monitoring. And I've had people... Stuff. I've had people tell me that, I mean, I had a lawyer, an abolitionist lawyer say, well, you know, I, one of my, one of my clients was going to be put on electronic monitoring, but I didn't think that they should be put on electronic monitoring because that's another form of prison. And I mean, I believe it's another form of prison, but that's not your decision to make. That's the decision of the person that that's got to decide what's my situation here. What's my situation here? Am I going to be better off being out on an electronic monitor or do I want to stay in prison? And that got even more intense during COVID, right? But oh, so, yeah. so um, how do we how do we make those decisions? I mean, I'm not going to oppose. I mean, there's a there's a lot of reforms that we could make to the prison system. I mean, there's this thing people call non-reform reform, right? So which is like, does the reform give more power to the police? You know, does it give more money to the police? I mean, does it advance the power of people on the ground to organize? And I think those are important questions to ask. But we also need to ask, where, how much power do we have? What, what can we win with the power that we have? Because in different moments, we have different levels of power. In 2020, you know, we were able to to exact a whole lot of shit from from the from from police and elected officials around policing. How's it going today? Not so good. It seemed like that was a big opportunity, and I don't know if it panned out. Well, I mean, part of it is that the other side always fights back. Yeah, you know, and they're usually they have. A, a better infrastructure and they're a little bit better prepared than we are. One of the things that upset me most when I got out of prison after doing what I'd consider at least decently hard time was hearing Absolutely. people tell me that reform or like trying to make things better inside was reactionary or reformist and it was working hand in hand with the state. And like I started thinking about my friends who like had been in a 24 hour lockdown for 15 or 20 years 
Like, we're not tearing down the prisons tomorrow. Like, I want their lives to be as good as possible, as quickly as possible. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Yeah. And anybody who says that, 99 times out of 100, they've never been locked up. That's what I was saying, too. You know, because if they've been locked up, they know that, that, that improving the conditions for people is a, is a, um, <laughs> let's see the, I see the comment in the chat about people who haven't been locked up have no right to comment on that. Well, I mean, I in that sense, I agree that, you know, whatever we can do for people, and that doesn't mean, I mean, there's a difference between what you fight for at an individual level and what you fight for strategically, right? Because strategically, you know, we're abolitionists, we don't want prison. But at the same time, what can we do at the moment? What's possible at the moment with the political power that we have to make change? We have to be able to also assess our own political potential, our own political power. What can we do? What can we change and what can't we change? We, you know, And we've got to accept that there's some things we can't change right now, but we ought to try to change what we can and think very carefully about where all the things we're trying to do fall into that. I think that's really important. I think that's really important for people to remember, like, it's okay if right now we can only get better food to where people can actually eat like humans. Um, that's I mean, still worth fighting for. I mean, let's take another example. Uh, let's talk about having a ceasefire in Palestine. Okay. Oh, that's it's a good point. Total, it's not total liberation, but it's sure as hell saving lives. You know, let's talk about getting food into Palestine. Let's talk about getting medic, you know, medicines into Palestine. Those are reforms, but shit, come on. That's now. a great analogy, too. It's still better right. to keep people alive. Exactly. Um, it's, not so, us to, it's not our position to to tell them what they shouldn't, uh, uh, what they should or shouldn't accept as a reform. Did you see Carlos's question? I think I missed it. It says, is this what dialectal materialism is all about? Okay, well, we can call it that if you like. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Um, so we we're getting close to time, but like I still got a couple questions I need or not need, but like I really want to know about. You were underground for almost thirty years. You do um, a good chunk of time, I'd say, like a legit little bit, and then you get out, and you get out to America. Um, I believe. What was that transition like to living now back in the States um, after doing your time? And like, how did you find that? How did you find reacclimating to the world? You know, my family, my partner got a job at the University of Illinois. So I moved to Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, a small town. Keep in mind for the previous 20 years I've lived either in Southern Africa or in prison. And now I'm moving to this overwhelmingly white small town, which is in the middle of the cornfields of Illinois, right? <laughs> I mean, we're surrounded by fucking corn, let me tell you. Yeah. And so, I mean, it was wonderful to be able to see my mother, to be able to see my partner, to be able to spend time with the kids and all that. That was fantastic. Politically, I had no idea what the hell I could do. It just seemed like an impossible situation. And I had a really terrible attitude toward everybody in the community that hadn't been locked up. I oh. just I just feel like ah, you you know, you people are soft, you don't know what you're talking about. Ooh. Interesting. So I um then in twenty eleven the county sheriff blessed me with a proposal to build a jail in the county. He wanted to spend $20 million on the jail. So I said, this is my moment. I'm fighting this fucker. So we we put some together some reading groups on the new Jim Crow, and we fought for the next eight years to try to stop them from spending money on the jail. But that got me out of the, you know, out of that bubble of, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm coming from prison. I'm, you know, I've got nothing in common with any of you. And I gradually then 
started working more with people who were coming home from prison. So we have a predominantly black group of formerly incarcerated folks, and we've been doing a lot of work since that time, helping them with reforms like housing, like employment, et cetera, et cetera, but also doing a lot of advocacy work in the with the electeds and with the power, decision makers to try to make some change. I really hate, I know we only got a, what, one minute left? We can stretch it a little. Like if you've got something you need to say or want to expand on, we can stretch it. What I really it. like to do, because, so Vic was supposed to be on this call with us. Wonderful. And Vic is a wonderful graphic artist who did the graphics for the book. And so I would really like to share some of the graphics with the people that are still on. And I see most people have stayed just for maybe five or 10 minutes because I think they're really yeah. interesting. And we're talking about a book that's trying to make the idea of mass incarceration accessible to people in, in, a, in a way that so much of the academic work that's out there does not do. And a lot of people will see it afterwards too on YouTube and stuff. We get lots of views there. So okay. uh, Liberty, if you want to help uh, help James with the... Thank you so the, much. Yeah. Okay, so this this is the cover of the book. And you can see that this is, this is like an aerial view of a prison dorm, right? So Vic did this drawing. She... She did this drawing based on a picture of a dorm in Alabama, I believe it was. Oh. And the, so the spacing and the bodies and everything about this is true to the proportions and the realities of, of what she saw. And the, it goes, you can't see it here, but it goes all the way down, all over. It covers the entire cover. So it really is a, a visual of mass incarceration. Go ahead and do the next slide. So this is her way of showing um, mass incarceration, just showing these profiles of people in large numbers and how it grew from less than 338,000 in 1972 to more than 2 million by 2009. That's a right. stunning statistic as well. Right. So but we, want to make, we want to make these statistics accessible to people. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Liberty. So there you see how it grew to 1.77 1, 1. million in uh, 2021. But that sort of slid past the main peak, which was 2009. Mm. Okay, so this is, a, this is a familiar scene to those of us that were in California prisons in the 19, in, in the early 2000s. They took every gym in, in every prison and turned it into a dorm. So I was in one of these for a very for a short period of time, two, three weeks. But the place that I was in had three tiers instead of two. So you oh. had three bunks. So the middle one we called the coffin because it was <laughs> because it was like being in a coffin. I was on the top one. So you look the, up and the you pictures see like this are nightmarish. Like yes. They give, they give me chills. Yeah, this is this is really such a powerful picture of mass incarceration. A lot of people have seen some of these pictures uh, of California prisons, but even still, I think it's still pretty powerful. Absolutely. And to and to make matters worse, this space is also segregated. So you can only walk down certain aisles. You can't go here. You can't go there. You can't go. To, you can't use this toilet. I mean, so it makes it difficult just to get around because you've got all these racial codes in place. Go ahead, Liberty. Yeah. So this is a little piece about an electronic monitor showing how the device works, but it also shows the way in which Vic did these incredible drawings of things, um, which uh, illustrate the some of the details, because we wanted to combine the sort of macro picture of mass incarceration as a number, as a statistic, and the details of what it means to be under mass incarceration in a daily in a daily level how does it reach down to you how does it reach down to your very ankle with this technology that track that tra that tracks you um and makes you pl plug yourself in every night in order to get the electronic monitor charged to be able to my uh, my counselor 
he every week this piece of shit would bring me into his office and he would track where I'd gone to see if it matched up with like where I'd called and told them because I had the ankle monitor. So we'd be like, well, you were on this street for 38 seconds. You were supposed to be at this street. Like just micro, like nitpicking, just trying to find ways to put me back in prison. And so like these ankle monitors are serious. Like they ruin people's lives. And they don't work. I mean, right. they show, they move, they tell people, they locate people in places where they're not. So they're very oh, sloppy technology. Fuck you. Fuck you, ankle monitor. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, I spent a year on it, so. Oh, God. This is a, a picture that Vic drew of Cece McDonald, who is a, um, a trans woman that got charged be because she uh, fought back, basically. So we wanted to bring out at least some of the details of what it was for people who are LGBTQ plus um, in, inside inside prison. I can tell you that being trans in the feds, I, I can't speak for the state, but in the feds is if they put you at the wrong custody level, they're trying to kill you. It is a, it is a death sentence. And even at the best custody level, it's still just a chance for these pigs to try to degrade and dehumanize these people. Um, so all solidarity with our trans family inside. Totally, totally. And that's, that's the same in the state. Um, is life-threatening. Being gay, being trans, being any of that is life-threatening. Makes me sad. All right, Liberty, here we go. So we also wanted to talk about disability. I think if you, I think there's a brilliant drawing if you look at the wheels. That's badass, the chains. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, I mean, Vic did a lot of, gave a lot of thought to this because there's a lot of pictures of people who are disabled trying to struggle with being in prison. And there's also a an aspect of that which is kind of almost pornographic that you're looking that you're looking at people who are incarcerated through the through the eyes of feeling sorry for them or feeling this kind of pity for them, which is not exactly the picture that we wanted to make. So we wanted to find a way to try to show this without to make sure it got represented to but but to make sure it didn't get represented as just these poor people, these poor people. Uh, full disclosure, I, I have to work on that sometimes because I'll find myself patronizing uh, people with disabilities inside, like like as if they're not, you know, fighters or as if they're not humans beyond that. And yeah, I really like this. I really like this picture. And that's something I got to check myself on a lot of times. This dude in ADX right now, and he's got two hooks. He blew off his hands. He's a Egyptian jihadi. And so he has the two hooks, but they won't give him prosthetic hands. So he has to try to eat that way. And it's just such a nightmare. Um, I don't know why I brought that up. <laughs> it's oh, it's, it's, but it's true. No, absolutely. Oh, is this by, is this drawing by a, uh, it is. By an incarcerated kid? Yeah. So one of the things that we included in here, and I'm not sure if it's in this deck, but we actually reached out to incarcerated people artists we worked through a things called the justice art coalition and they they correspond with uh with a lot of people who do art who are incarcerated and we reached out to them and said we want to commission some portraits of different people and drawings of different people um by people who are in um who are in incarcerated and we wanted to include their artwork in the book itself so we have about nine i think portraits of people by people mm -hmm. who are incarcerated this is one this is not one of them but this is a was done by somebody who was incarcerated okay go ahead liberty so this is a beautiful drawing of a woman named Dolores Canales, who's, um, I don't know if you're familiar with her at all, Eric, but she's done a lot of work around, her son is in Pelican Bay um, and was part of the Pelican Bay hunger strike. She herself spent about 25 years in prison, some of really? that in solitary, and she's been a, a real key figure in terms of organizing um, 
organizing support for the hunger strikers in Pelican Bay. So this is a drawing that one of the uh, people that uh, one of the artists that we commissioned, and I'm I'm very sorry to say that we credited this to the wrong person. Oh, no. And I can't remember the name of the person who actually did the drawing. It's a beautiful drawing, though. And it's interesting because he drew a, he drew a black and white picture, which was nice, but then he just kind of threw this one in, and we looked at this, and we said, whoa, this is awesome. We want, we want to use this one. Yeah, badass. Stunning. Okay, so this this is the other part when, I, when I'm talking about how when I'm talking about showing the daily life of prison, but also one of the things we want to emphasize here is the way in which people use whatever technology is available to them is a form of resistance to the system. It's not just it's not just people playing with stuff. It's people trying to assert their humanity in a very in dehumanizing environment. And all the, I mean, people talk about, for example, people talk about, you know, making tattoos and stuff as if it's some kind of criminal activity. It's asserting your humanity in an inhuman environment and using whatever is available to you to make a tattoo gun and drawing whatever you want to draw on yourself to express who you are and how you're fighting back against the system. And whether that's doing a tattoo or making a lighter so you can light a cigarette, you can light up a joint, whatever you want to do. Um, we have we have a, a whole range of technologies. I'm sure, Eric, you're familiar with, with yeah. all these technologies that 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 people take for granted in prison. But this is this is re, this is a form of resistance, and we need to be talking about when people make when people make pruno. That's resistance, you know. When people smuggle smuggle in cell phones, it's resistance. They're trying to. It's not. They're not trying to call shots and 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 call hits. They're trying to communicate with their family when the system is trying to make make them pay outrageous fees to use a, to make a phone call. When I was in the uh, shoe at McCreary, at that time we were still allowed radios. They've taken that away since then. But my celly would would buy broken ones from people and strip the wires like, of the rubber stuff off the wires and take magnets and like make an antenna so that we could get radio stations from like Nashville and Memphis. And I felt like we were stealing radio time, like we were stealing air and it felt like such an act of resistance. And I love that you put that in and that you included it. Like that's so serious. And this is stuff that, you know, we have all these books that give us all these statistics on mass incarceration, but what about the daily, the daily resistance of, of people who are incarcerated? How do we, how do we show that? So we really put a big emphasis on that in this, in this book, I'm trying to get that balance. Here we go. This is another example where um, particularly women make, do makeup um using various materials uh making a like lipstick and then we people make chess pieces out of various things um, out of everything out of everything right it's crazy i've seen chess pieces made out of like toilet paper and they're as like hard as rock right 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 exactly all these things and all that all that stuff is about you know making your time a little bit more bearable and once again we come back to to abolition purism. So is that is there something wrong with people doing that? They should take away the chess pieces because they're not that, turned down the system. Yet. No, it's not. It's all about building as much power as you can build in the situation that you're in. Yeah. What do we got next? We must be pretty close to the end here. I think uh we've hit the end of the slide deck. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Liberty. I really appreciate you taking the time to do that. And I Appreciate very much the people that have stayed on for an extra 15 minutes to uh, to just see that because I really I really wanted Vic's work to be to be um, to be highlighted. Yeah, you know, I didn't know Vic before we started this book. In fact, Vic cold emailed me and said she'd read my other mass incarceration and said she she liked like the graphics. And she would like to make a graphic version of this. And I got, oh, no, I don't really want to another book. But she convinced me. And I think she's uh, done an amazing job. And she's just such, 
she's so creative and thoughtful and she's so um, respectful of the incarcerated population that she's drawing or somehow portraying with her with her artwork it's been a great pleasure you know we worked on this for three years before we even met in person um but we just did everything from zoom and it was quite it was quite an amazing experience so i'm just real sorry that she's not here maybe she's on i don't know if you are stick something in the chat but um, um otherwise... before we go i just want to remind everyone please write a prisoner please support a prisoner uh randy platt is my best friend inside he's still in adx he'll be there for 14 years um please write him please do whatever you can to build relationships with people inside this wouldn't have happened if josh davidson didn't build a relationship with me inside that developed into a book that developed into a web series now with liberty so please please take prisoners serious and please take their dignity and life serious and james thank you so much it was really fucking awesome meeting you dude Really uh, it was fun. great talking to you, Eric. I appreciate you and I appreciate all your work and you know all your fighting spirit. So let's keep it let's keep it moving. Oh yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been an incredible conversation. I'm sorry that we didn't have Vic here, but so glad that we got to look at the book. Uh, just a reminder to folks if they haven't picked it up, um, both these books are worth worth grabbing, worth reading. Pass it to a friend, uh, rattling the cages and the warehouse. Um, it's been an incredible evening. Thank you all. And I hope that uh, we get to meet in person someday. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Take care. Good night.